Is Parkside a healthy church? If you're watching this video and you're not a member of Parkside Evangelical Church, is the church that you attend, is it a healthy church? What does a healthy church look like? Welcome to Parkside. Welcome to this hour of worship and praise as we come into the presence of our God. And we're going to be hearing from James. And James gives us five different ways of identifying what a healthy church does. It's not a definitive list, but it's always good to bring the Word of God captive to all of our faith and practice as a church and as individuals. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. We're going to be thinking about the deep thoughts of God as we come to the Word of God, but it's also important that we fix our eyes on the glory of our God as well. And so, will you join me as we sing, O Lord my God. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Great thou 
Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you are Lord of creation. We thank you and praise you for seeing the lofty mountain grandeur. We thank you and praise you for the beauty of spring and of summer. We thank you for the sunshiny days and we thank you for the blossoms on the trees, for the beautiful flowers in our gardens and all of these things speak of your glory and how great you are. But Lord, that hymn that we just sung reminded us again that when we think of the cross, that the Son of God was willing to die upon that cross, we scarce can take it in. Help us to do so, dear Lord. Help us to stand in amazement and joy that you should love us so much that you should send Jesus to die for our sins. Give us the strength, the peace, and the hope that can only come from him. Help us to lean on Jesus. Help us to find strength and hope in him. Help us, dear Lord, to walk in his paths, to learn from him. Bless us and enable us, dear Lord, to experience something of that grandeur, that hope, that challenge that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit as you open up the Word of God, as you ignite our hearts with a deeper love for you, as we sing your praises and as we pray to you, Lord, be with us as we spend time with you in this service. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join with me as we sing Amazing Grace?
Will you pray with me? Our Lord and our God, we thank you and praise you that you made us. We thank you for that amazing grace that sustains us through all the trials and tribulations of life. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you give us hope and joy and purpose. But nevertheless, Lord, in the midst of this broken world, so cursed by sin, that the whole of creation groans and yearns like a woman in labor pains, longing for its redemption, longing for the return of Jesus. We thank you and praise you for these truths that you've revealed in your word. But Lord, we are experiencing the living reality of that. But Lord, we thank you that we have foretastes of glory to come. We thank you that we can have glorious measures of healing in this life. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you make such a difference to us. You bless us, anoint us in supernatural and glorious ways. But sometimes you just use ordinary methods, the same methods that you use to sustain the rest of your creation. And we thank you and praise you because they come from the same loving hand. And so, Lord, we pray for all of those that are struggling with health issues at the moment. We pray that they would receive healing from you, divine, supernatural, glorious healing, but also that they would find those appointments, that they would have those operations and procedures, that they would receive strength and healing from you, that their eyesight would improve, that their walking and mobility would improve, that their heart conditions would improve, that all of the other maladies and aches and pains of this life would be alleviated by these means. We do thank you for a National Health Service, but we're very aware that they're overrun and underfunded. We're, over, uh, we're aware, dear Lord, how difficult it is uh, to get appointments and to uh, have um, those appointments not cancelled. And it can be so heartaching and frustrating that we wait so long. Lord, give us your peace as we wait on you. I just pray that those health conditions wouldn't get any worse. Oh, Heavenly Father, glorify your name through these things. Lord, again, we want to lift up to you the situation in our country. We're aware that inflation is causing prices to rise. We're aware that uh, the, this is likely to get worse, and these things concern us. Lord, please provide for us. As money gets tight, as our budgets uh, don't expand with the uh, um, expanding prices. Please provide for us. Help us to make good decisions. Help us to uh, recognize where we can make savings, where savings can be made so that we can prioritize our, our saving, so that we can pr prioritize our giving and uh, we can look after ourselves and our loved ones. We pray also for the terrible situation in Ukraine. And again, dear Lord, our heart's desire is that you would minimize the number of deaths there, that there would be a hasty uh, ending to this horrible war, that there would be uh, um, a negoti negotiated settlement, that you would bring peace back to Ukraine. Have mercy on them, dear Lord. We pray for the Christians in Ukraine. We pray, dear Lord, that you would watch over them and help the churches that meet together. We thank you and praise you that many of those churches seem to have expanded in their numbers as people uh, um, turn to you in this time of overwhelming stress. Lord, please continue that process. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look to the Word of God next, but first we're going to sing, Here from the world we turn, Jesus to seek. Will you sing this with me? Here from the world we turn Jesus to seek. Here may his loving voice tenderly speak. Jesus, our dearest friend, while at thy feet we bend, oh, let thy smile. 
Christ graciously shine. Oh, for thy mighty power, oh, for a blessed shower, filling this hallowed hour with joy divine. We're going to turn to the Word of God now. Will you bow your head as we ask God to speak to us? Heavenly Father, this is your holy Word. Bless and anoint the reading of it and the preaching of it, that we may be blessed and challenged, that we may be comforted. And in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. So we're coming up to James chapter 5 and we're starting at verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, he, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. I want us to think about what the marks are of a healthy church, and I think that this brief little passage gives us a few clues about what James regards as important in the life of the church. And so a healthy church is firstly a compassionate church. James says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Now that can sound a little bit blig. Uh, uh, now that can sound a little bit glib. It would be very easy to turn around to somebody and say, "Oh, I'm so sorry that you broke your leg. I'm so sorry that your house burnt down. Just pray about it and shrug your shoulders and walk away." But I think what James is really challenging us to do is not just say that for somebody, but to actually pray for the individual as well. Prayer should be our number one instinct in times of suffering. And is it, isn't it interesting that James just assumes that in the life of a healthy church, there will be some people who are suffering. And he has a compassion about that. He knows that the ultimate source is to find consolation in God. If we read the book of Psalms, we find again and again in the midst of life's trials and sufferings and heartaches and persecutions, the psalmist, whether it's David or Asaph or one of the other psalmists, again and again, they find their consolation in God. And that makes all the difference. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, and if you have cooperated with God, and if you've gone to him in prayer, in the midst of your sufferings and your difficulties, you'll know the thing that got you through those times of trial and difficulty and heartache was prayer. Because you saw answers to those prayers. Sometimes in the midst of the pain and the anguish and the injustice, you had the simple consolation that you were speaking to Jesus who understood, who had been through those, that pain, that injustice, that betrayal, that hurt that you were feeling. And he knew and he understood and he was willing to give you that strength to go through. 
other times in prayer. You prayed that God would deliver you from those difficulties and then Jesus answered that prayer and you saw your suffering transformed into gratitude and joy. And so prayer has to be a central part of the solution to life's sufferings. And so we as a church should be concerned and recognize that just because my life's going well and God is blessing me at the moment, well, that must mean that God's favor uh, must be on me because I'm a good person. We must get rid of those foolish ideas, but rather be thinking there, but for the grace of God go I, and here's a person who is in tremendous need and my, needs my consolation and my encouragement and my prayers. And so we bring our heartaches, our difficulties, and all the trials of life to God in prayer. Secondly, a healthy church sings. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. And so James doesn't just roll around in misery and just assume that everybody is going through a hard time. Uh, he assumes that in a good, healthy church, there will be some people who do suffer, but also there will be others that have tremendous reasons to rejoice. In fact, we all have tremendous reasons. Re we all have tremendous reasons to rejoice because we always have that consolation in Jesus. But nevertheless, God is a good God. And there are times of our life, periods of our life, where God provides for us and where our family seems to be thriving and where good things are happening and where our health isn't causing us any problems. And we can rejoice in all of those good things. There's other times when we have answers to prayer and we have endless reasons to sing God's praise. It's interesting, he says, let him sing praise. And so a good church should be singing. And one of the reasons why I don't just put up the sermon uh, up online and ignore uh, all of the singing, one of the main reasons that I do an entire service, and we always have four uh, different hymns that we sing throughout this service, is because singing is so important for our spiritual well-being. The book of Psalms, we've already talked about that, the Psalms of suffering and difficulty, but the Psalms are also full of singing of God's praise. In fact, it's interesting that you could do a literal translation of this uh, because the Greek word there uh, the, it, that James originally wrote in, it says, if anyone is, is anyone cheerful, let him psalm, let him sing psalms, let him uh, uh, pour out his soul in psalms. Uh, the word, the Greek word there is psalmeto, and it's, a, uh, uh, it's the verb form of, uh, related to the book uh, of psalms in the early church. And bear in mind that uh, James was writing to a predominantly Jewish church where the vast majority of people were raised in the synagogue their instincts would have automatically to be to sing the Psalms. And this is how the original audience would have originally understood it. Their instincts were to sing the very words that Jesus himself sang, to sing the very words that God himself had inspired. One of the things that I've tried to do since I became pastor of Parkside Evangelical Church is slowly and gently introduce the idea of Psalm singing to the church. And so mainly in the evenings, but sometimes in the morning services, we do try to sing a psalm. And uh, I do that quite deliberately, partly on the basis of this, but also partly because I think it's important to bring those truths deeper into our hearts and our souls. And I hope and pray that other people in this church actually see the value of that. Because when you're singing the psalms, it feels very, very different than just merely reading them. Obviously, we're not chanting them like the Anglicans do, nor can we sing them as they originally were sung because we have to learn Greek or Hebrew or something. Uh, we sing uh, a, a, a translation of the Psalms that's been put into verse form so that they can be sung to familiar hymn tunes. But nevertheless, they're fairly accurate translations. And it's, uh, if you know your NIV or the ESV and you re, uh, you uh, use the, uh, and you sing, sing Psalms, which is the uh, version of the Psalter that we use in this church, you'll find it's very, very familiar. And so 
psalm singing and singing of hymns and songs and praise and worship is one of those glorious things that lifts our hearts into heaven and that gives us a foretaste of the glory to come and that feeds our souls. So we should be familiar with our psalters and sing God's praise. Another sign of a healthy church is that a healthy church prays for healing. Now, notice I didn't say a healthy church heals everybody who comes, or it doesn't say heals everybody who has enough faith. If you turn on your TV or if you attend certain churches, that's strongly the impression that you'll receive, that if uh, uh, this amazing miracle worker is coming and uh, this man has been gloriously, gloriously gifted by God to heal people and uh, people get very, very excited about that. And praise God, some people are genuinely healed by these men, by God's grace and mercy. But on the other hand, it can also uh, lead to tremendous disappointment because not everybody is healed. And sometimes, the, uh, subtly and gently, sometimes in a fairly crass way, the blame is put on the individual because they didn't have enough faith. But that's not what James says. Let's read carefully what James says. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Not just one amazing healer, uh, not somebody with an extraordinary gift, but just the leadership of the church. Um, I'm an elder, uh, the pastor, uh, there's, we have other elders in the church, and it's appropriate for, to call for the mature and the godly in the church to pray. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Uh, some people believe that there's, uh, there is uh, special power that God blesses and anoints in the anointing of oil. And I don't see, see any problem with anointing people with oil. I've sometimes done it myself at people's request. But there's another way of understanding this, which is uh, because the, the word, uh, uh, there's two words for, uh, for uh, anointing with oil in the New Testament. And one is related to Christ, the word Christ, uh, Christos in Greek. And uh, it, that's always associated with anointing for a special purpose, which is why we have the name Jesus Christ. Or David, King David, was anointed to be king, and sometimes the priests were anointed to be priests. And then there's a separate word in the Greek language which is more related to rubbing in oil. And so some commentators believe that actually this is talking about uh, providing practical healing. Don't forget there was no health service, there was no uh, reliable doctors that everybody could, could afford. And uh, so some commentators believe that by anointing them with oil, we're to actually talking about giving what we would think of as a massage or something like that, uh, rubbing in healing ointments and lotions uh, into the aching and difficult parts. Or sometimes it would be a, a balm that would have a strong smell, like uh, you have uh, um, Vicks Vapor Rub. Uh, there, these were the primitive uh, healing tools that were available at the time. And so other commentators who are saying, get involved in the practical care of people as well. But I suspect that the truth is maybe a combination of the both of those. Both, I think, are valid. They're often practiced in good conscience by many biblical Christians. But providing that practical, hands-on uh, love and care for people is essential. And then he says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now, let me notice what it doesn't say. Look carefully at these words. It does not say, and the prayer of faith will heal the one who is sick, and the Lord will heal him. No, it says the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. I do believe in mir miraculous healing. I believe that it's essential that we bring our, uh, our heartaches, our healings, uh, our maladies, our sickness, our aches and pains and everything else to God in prayer. And you know people, if you're a mature Christian, that have had miraculous healing from God. And I know people that have had miraculous healing from God. Utterly flummoxed the doctors, completely inexplicable. And God does intervene in powerful ways like that. 
I have no way to experience that and I cannot tell you why it is that God does that for one person and not for another person. But I do know that God is consistent in his mercy, grace and love. And he's also truthful. It would be very easy for him to give us the cheap answer and say, yes, if you just have enough faith, then you will be healed. And if you're not healed, it's your fault because you didn't have enough faith. Actually, although it seems a wonderful promise, it can end up uh, with people feeling thoroughly, thoroughly miserable. So instead he says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. That's a slight difference, but an important one as well. Sometimes they're saved from their sickness. But nevertheless, other times they can be saved from despondency. Other times, sadly, at the end of a life, it's that they're saved and their souls raised up and the Lord will rise them up, uh, um, will raise him up. And so, again, that could mean that he'll be raised off his sick bed, but equally that his soul will be raised up into heaven. The language there, I believe, is deliberately ambiguous because both happen. You, if you're a mature Christian, if you've been praying for people in sickness for any length of time, you will have seen both happen. You will know that some people are wonderfully healed and you will know that others sadly pass away. And this is the promise. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Which brings us to our fourth point, a healthy church confesses. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. It's very important that we as a church have the humility to recognize that sometimes we get it wrong. And when we do get it wrong, the most important thing to do is the thing that often comes uh, at the, uh, completely against our instincts. Our instincts, when we've hurt somebody, are always to try and minimize it. Our natural instincts are, according to the flesh, according to the way that the world does things, according to our background, according to the examples that we've had inflicted on us, our, back found, back, uh, our instincts are often to sort of say, well, I hope that she doesn't mind. Oh, she's a very loving person. I'm sure that, he, that she'll forgive me. Oh, it's, um, I, I don't want to make a fuss. I don't want to embarrass the other person. We've got an endless number of excuses for not going to somebody and saying, look, I'm really sorry that I let you down. I'm really sorry that I hurt you. I'm really sorry that I gossiped behind your back. I'm really sorry that I uh, uh, did this to you. I'm really sorry that whatever it is. But James wants a culture of humility within a church. James, through the Holy Spirit, is challenging us to live humbly, to say that we don't always get it right. And so, therefore, we confess our sins to one another. Our Catholic friends understand that, that um, you're to go to confession and that you're to say your, uh, c confess your sins to the priest and the priest will reassure uh, uh, you of your forgiveness. Uh, our understanding of this verse is, yes, there are some times when we feel really, really overwhelmed by guilt and shame because of something we've done and we go to a very close, trusted uh, Christian friend or one of the elders and we say, I'm really, bur I'm really burdened by this. I feel terrible. Uh, I, I just need to talk about it through, uh, uh, through with somebody. And uh, it's important that if somebody comes to you uh, with something that they've done, that we reassure them again of the gospel and that we reassure them of God's forgiveness. That's another way that we confess our uh, com can confess our sins to one another. But I think in the everyday life of the church, the most important thing that we should do is when we've let people down, when we've hurt them, uh, it, that we should never try to minimize it or explain it away or make excuses, but rather we should say, simply say, you're right, I let you down, I'm really sorry. And it's amazing, if you have a culture like that in a church, if one person starts doing it, then suddenly other people start doing it. And the tension in the church can go down and down and down. And I'm not thinking of any particular problems or any individuals within this church, because thankfully I'm profoundly grateful that there already does seem to be a bit of a culture of doing this, 
and it's a healthy thing. And the only way that I can encourage that to continue to happen and continue to grow is to constantly encourage you to do this. We can never afford to lose this essential practice of confessing our sins to one another when we let each other down. Our fifth uh, um, uh, principle or uh, sign of a healthy church is that a healthy church knows its Bible. Now, this is a bit obscure because the passage I'm talking about is Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the fruit, the earth bore its fruit. And so we might look at this and we might think to ourselves, well, what's that? That's not teaching us anything about the Bible. But on the other hand, If I was to ask you, have you ever read that passage in the Bible? Do you know about that? When you heard this uh, this quote, it wasn't not even a quote, it's an allusion to a passage in the Old Testament. There's an assumption that James has is that the vast majority of people that he's writing to automatically know who Elijah was. He, he just assumes that people know that there was a time in the reign of Ahab that uh, the people of God were rebelling against God, uh, that uh, they were uh, under God's judgment, and so Elijah was sent to, uh, as a prophet to demand repentance, and when that repentance refused to happen, Elijah prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then it's interesting, you see that period, three and a half years. And for more mature Christians that study their Bibles very, very carefully, you suddenly find that that three and a half year period comes up in times of judgment elsewhere in the scriptures. And so those things start to draw together the whole of the Bible. But let me return to the point, a healthy church knows its Bible. And so the assumption is, that uh, that Christians need to know their Bibles. We once lived in a culture that was strongly influenced by the Bible. We once lived in a culture where even if people didn't go to church, the Bible was actually taught in the schools and most people have to uh, study uh, a scripture O-level and they would have to quote passages of the Bible and it would be taught in primary schools and it would be taught and read from in the uh, uh, school assemblies and people would sing hymns and everything else. And even if they didn't go to church themselves, they were familiar with all of the stories because they were taught. Many people, far more people used to go to church and there was large Sunday schools uh, that were were out there and so there was a culture that would have automatically picked up on this uh, allusion to the Old Testament. It's interesting, in the 1980s, during the height of the Cold War, when President Ronald Reagan was President of America and when Brezhnev was the um, President of the Soviet Union, Uh, There was a meeting between Brezhnev and Reagan and as they talked about nuclear disarmament and they were trying to ease the tensions that were happening across the world and uh, there was compromises that had to be made and uh, there was uh, budgets that that had to be agreed on and all sorts of other other things. But obviously Reagan didn't speak English, uh, didn't speak Russian and Brezhnev didn't speak English and so they had to say everything through translators. And uh, the translator uh, um, of Brezhnev mistranslated something. Uh, Reagan, as he was talking about his desire to try and do things but overcome the difficulties, Reagan uh, said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, if you know your Bible, you'll know that that's an allusion to something that Jesus said, talking about the weakness of our mortal bodies and our, our fallen instincts can let us down, even though our spiritual uh, desire is to please God and do the right thing. And so the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So when uh, he, he said that to Brezhnev, the, um, uh, the translator translated it into Russian and Brezhnev suddenly looked very, very puzzled. And he couldn't work out what was happening and he double looked at the, uh, at the translator and he looked over at Reagan and then the American translator, who obviously did speak Russian, uh, laughed and had to explain it. And then eventually uh, the translator explained it to Reagan. And it turned out 
that the Russian translator translated the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak as the vodka at dinner was very good but the meat wasn't quite so good. <laughs> so a complete misunderstanding because of course communism was an atheistic ideology and the only type of people that would be allowed to become tra translators for the communist elite would have been dedicated atheists and so this man was utterly ignorant of the sayings of Jesus. And so that illusion that Ronald Reagan just assumed that uh, Brezhnev and the translator would know was completely lost on him. And increasingly, we're turning into a, into a country like that. I uh, know of another example uh, um, uh, that a friend of mine said, he was in a jeweler shop and uh, he was looking at the different jewelry and uh, uh, he was say, saying, uh, uh, what's that over there? Why, why, um, uh, there's a bloke on that cross there. What's all that about? Why, why do you have one of those? What's that called? And the uh, jeweler had to explain, oh, this is a crucifix. I think it's a Christian thing. So this man had no idea about what a crucifix was. That's the level of ignorance, an indication of the level of ignorance in our culture. And so, obviously, as I, as I preach on uh, the Bible, I have to assume that there will be people, pe pe people that don't know their Bibles and that don't, don't know these illusions. And so I explain them in my, uh, in my sermons as best as I can. But a healthy church should have a large number of people that are reading their Bibles on a regular basis, that are deeply committed to the, the authority of the scriptures and that can pick up on these allusions to Elijah and to Ahab and to the uh, other things that should capture our imaginations. Now, if you've never read the whole Bible, here's a little uh, uh, hint for you. If you've never read uh, the Bible and you've got, or you've tried reading it and you got stuck in uh, Leviticus or in the genealogies or the so-called boring bits of the Bible, my advice to you would be to try reading through the Bible and skip the boring bits and just stick with the story. Just keep, uh, uh, you'll find a few pages. If you flip forward, uh, you should be able to find a passage where it starts the story on again. And if you read the Bible, you'll just pick up on those glorious stories. And they're always fascinating and interesting. And so continue to read the Bible for yourself in your own individual times, but also study the Bible with other people that know it better than you do. And you'll find that you pick up enormous clues and helps from godly people that have been reading the, uh, reading the Bible. And over the years, you too, in the time, uh, in God's good time, will be able to mentor and help disciple young Christians when you are, are a mature Christian as well. And so these are the signs of a healthy church. Not a definitive list, not an exhaustive list, but a healthy church ought to be one that is passionate about prayer, supporting the uh, infirm the, uh, and the suffering, seeking God's healing and blessing and prayer, should be singing songs and, of praise and worship and even the Psalms and should know its Bible really well. Can we, uh, uh, can we pray? Heavenly Father, please bless us. Bless this church. Help us, dear Lord, to live up to this high standard. Help us, dear Lord, to show great love, to pray, to seek your blessing. Help us to know our Bibles and help us to thrive so that you will draw people into the life of faith and that you will be glorified. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude our worship now as we sing I love thy kingdom, Lord.
I hope and pray that that was a blessing to you, and I hope and pray that you will know God's goodness and mercy day by day throughout the whole of this coming week. And now, will you say the grace with me? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.